So I think everybody's aware that um, fundamental aging processes can begin at or before conception. It turns out that Down syndrome, for example, related to aging lipocyte is a senescence-driven disorder, and it looks like administering senolytics will improve neurite outgrowth in the context of Down syndrome, as shown by the MIT group. And these, there are many things that can um, uh, impact the rate at which uh, fundamental aging processes occur, uh, again, throughout the lifespan. So not just chronological age, but um, things like the IGF um, axis and all kinds of other things can accelerate these processes. Um, the gyro science hypothesis formulated by Gordon Lithgow, uh, Felipe Sierra, um, Brian Kennedy, holds that these fundamental aging processes may be root cause contributors to the bulk of conditions that cause morbidity, mortality, and health expenditures, including not just the geriatric syndromes and chronic diseases, but many acute diseases, decreased resilience that is delayed or impaired ability to recover, say, after infections or um, respond to a vaccine, decreased remaining survival, aging phenotypes, and reduced reproduction. The unitary theory holds that these fundamental aging processes, pillars of aging, however you want to slice and dice them into anywhere from four to 15 groups, are highly interlinked, and that in general, but not always, if you target one of them, you tend to affect all the rest. Um, over the years, um, uh, preclinical studies have indicated that there may be interventions that can target some of these processes. There are at least 35 classes of interventions. Um, in uh, preclinical studies. Um, I'll focus on senolytics, but I could be talking about any of these other groups. Uh, I could be talking about NED precursors or um, sertraline agonists or whatever. And there's emerging evidence in preclinical studies for benefits of agents that target um, cellular senescence, either senomorphic sets, agents that reduce the secretary state of senescent cells like metformin, rapamycin, um, ruxolitinib and so forth, or senolytics that eliminate senescent cells uh, selectively on at least 70 conditions um, in preclinical models. So one of the things that's been established to try to investigate whether um, some of these interventions might be translatable into humans is the translational geroscience network, which is NIH funded. They were crazy enough to make me PI of it to begin with, but I think we'll rotate it around uh, the system. Um, the, app, the program just went in for competing renewals, so we'll, we'll see what happens. It started off with eight institutions uh, listed at the top and now has involved uh, many others. And the notion here is to um, use interventions that could be lifestyle interventions um, uh, to repurposed agents or natural products or new chemical entities uh, to uh, target fundamental aging processes in the context of very serious conditions for which there are no good treatments because we don't know the downsides of these things. So we're worried about risk-benefit ratio. This is in contrast but also in parallel to the TAME approach which uh, Nir may speak about um, at, at some point during the meeting and probably will. Uh, so I, Nir and I view these things as parallel um, complementary kinds of approaches, uh, where the TAME study involves a secondary prevention approach. These studies involve um, actual treatment approaches. So currently there are 82 and two more studies. Um, uh, there are 82 studies underway or planned. There are another two that are coming along. I don't obviously have time to go through all of them. Uh, most of the studies are occurring in the US and some are occurring in Northern Europe, including uh, a couple here in Copenhagen. Um, about thir 30 of these studies are related to senolytics or comparing senolytics to other interventions. The rest are things like um, nutritional interventions, uh, ketogenic diets, those sort of things, uh, physical function kinds of interventions, combinations of interventions like combining, for example, senolytics with uh, resistance training, um, various repurposed agents. Um, and uh, uh, some new chemical entity studies. And some of the studies are observational. So a couple of early trials have been um, published. Uh, there was one of the senolytic combination of disatinib and carcetin. It's a phase um, one study, so it's open label with all the problems that open label studies have with huge placebo effects, potentially. Uh, and it was to give nine doses of these agents, which are um, 
have very, very short elimination half-lives and act within half an hour to start killing senescent cells, which take a week to six weeks to reform so these agents can be given intermittently. Um, and um, what this particular study showed in the context of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is an inevitably fatal senescence-driven um, lung disorder uh, that typically occurs in older individuals, um, was improvements in physical performance. Uh, the main thing as a clinician that you see with um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis that people experience is frailty. Uh, that's what actually kills them more than the respiratory disease itself. So this was a very short study just to look at safety and tolerability and adverse events, but it was noted given the caveat that this is open label and potentially a lot of um, you know, um, uh, bias involved because the subjects and the uh, physicians knew which agent, knew that the patients were on agents. Uh, but there did seem to be um, some improvement in six minute walk, um, four meter gait speed, chair stands, and um, short physical performance battery. And this has led to the initiation of a phase 2A randomized control trial. Another very early study in the case of Senalytics looked at target engagement. So the FDA and I think the EMA, as we're working with them, will require that we either study diseases where we know that around 100% of people will have senescent cells, or if we're doing more general trials, we have to prove subjects have senescent cells before we give the agent. So um, there's, uh, you know, why, why would you give a potentially uh, an agent that may have side effects if you don't know that the target that you're treating is present? Uh, and that, I'll come to that when I talk about drug diagnostics in a moment. But it did seem, in a, again, a very small trial in obese, younger, uh, diabetic women with incipient renal failure who have a lot of senescent cells in their adipose tissue, uh, that there appeared to be some decrease in markers of senescence, none of which are perfectly sensitive or specific. Uh, but there was a decrease in um, uh, P16, um, senescence-associated beta-galactosidase. This was after giving three doses of disatinib and quercetin on day zero, one, and two. Uh, disatinib has an elimination half-life of three hours, quercetin 11 hours. So uh, these drugs are completely gone by 33 hours. So the second biopsy was done 11 days after the last dose, well after the drugs were cleared. And uh, there seemed to be a decrease in certain markers um, that are not completely perfect. They're about two-thirds sensitive and specific of senescence in repeat adipose tissue biopsies. There was also a decrease in immune-activated macrophage uh, infiltration and in fibrosis as measured by crown-like structures. Um, in a larger number of subjects from, um, the, uh, who had idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, um, we looked at a variety of markers across these subjects. And one of the things we're interested in testing is this unitary hypothesis that these fundamental aging processes may be interlinked. Um, a factor that we looked at is Alpha Clotho. Um, Clotho is the Greek goddess of birth. Uh, she's the one who holds the spool of uh, the fake goddess who holds the, sp the spool that uh, has the threat of life. Uh, there was a protein discovered about 26 years ago now that is a very large transmembrane protein called Alpha Clotho. Um, it's produced mainly in the brain, the kidneys, and to some extent in fat tissue. It decreases with age. If you overexpress it in mice, it leads to a tremendous increase in health span and lifespan. It's decreased in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and what we found was that this very short uh, administration of disatinib and quercetin in 20 out of 20 subjects caused an increase in urine alpha clotho in every single subject. Again, indicating that these fundamental aging processes may be interlinked. In preclinical studies, we'd found that these senolytic agents and also genetic clearance of senescent cells result in an increase in alpha clotho in older animals. So this brings up GERA diagnostics. You know, I don't like talking simply about aging clocks. Uh, the best aging clock I have is a wall calendar in my birth certificate. Um, uh, but, um, you know, knowing biological age, uh, it, which is distinct from uh, chronological age to some extent, isn't enough as far as the FDA and EMA and CMA and CLIA are concerned. Um, what we need are things that change in response to interventions, uh, that tell us which intervention to use and when, and when the change predicts a change in clinical state. 
so there are a lot of um, biomarkers that do not have these characteristics. Uh, and then uh, there's also a requirement that these kinds of drug diagnostics be applicable across ethnic groups, sexes, socioeconomic groups, and are reproducible, reliable, scalable. So there's a set of nine criteria that have to be met. And overall, it looks like composite scores of these uh, kinds of things that uh, look at multiple fundamental aging processes may be the way to go. So one of the things that are being developed across these 82 trials are Jared diagnostic scores. So the same things are being measured by the Facility for Jared Science Analysis across all um, of these trials. Uh, an early um, uh, composite score was devised by David Allison based on the um, um, study that I talked about in obese diabetic younger women. Uh, it only took uh, senescence markers, took 10 of them. And even though it was a tiny number of subjects, you can see a dramatic change in these uh, blood factors. Uh, now what the facility for JR Science Analysis is doing that's led by Tamara Ciccone, who's probably somewhere in here, um, is uh, across the trials, um, we're looking at multiple analytes in serum and plasma, PBMCs, and these things aren't just proteins, but there are many non-coding nucleotides that look like they're incredibly important, like mitochondrial DNA, certain circular RNAs and DNAs and certain microRNAs, as well as um, bioactive molecules that are, that are not necessarily proteins or peptides. Uh, similarly, we're looking across the trials at 35 analytes in urine. Where we can get it, we're looking at 50 analytes in cerebrospinal fluid. We're looking at analytes in, or developing them in um, sputum, tears, uh, for the eye trials in anterior um, uh, aqueous humor. Uh, and then uh, when biopsies can be obtained, we're looking at things like Sen Mayo composite scores of uh, factors um, that reflect fundamental aging processes. Now these factors don't just reflect um, SAS factors related to cellular senescence. They reflect things like what's happening with mTOR activity, what's happening with search ones, what's happening with NAD and downstream um, effects of those kinds of things. So we're trying to look, and Clotho and so forth, we're trying to look across fundamental aging processes, including beginning to look at certain hormones like 17-alpha estradiol. So I'll just briefly go through a couple of the trials because we don't have much time um, to give a flavor of these things. Um, one that I don't have a slide for is looking in sheep, for example, with um, uh, State University of Colorado, a land-grant <laughs> university. And in that trial, we're looking at using shampoos made with Senolytics to try to improve uh, uh, wool production, uh, wool thickness and quality and color in Argyle sheep, um, which live for 12 years but only produce useful wool between the ages of uh, two and five. So they're usually put down at age five and that means 40% of their life they're growing up to produce sheep, to produce wool. If this kind of thing would work, it would have a huge impact on, on um, the poorest countries in, in South America. Um, so the, these kinds of trials go beyond human trials and are looking at um, agricultural applications, military applications. So one of the, um, th there are four trials for Alzheimer's disease or mild cognitive impairment. I'll just mention one of them, the Alzheimer's trial. This is mainly to look at um, safety and tolerability uh, and uh, various uh, parameters related to um, uh, not just senescence, but other factors in repeated CSF samples, as well as uh, blood, and then looking at cognition and functional status in uh, various Im imaging modalities. Uh, a smaller trial that is part of the TGN is just coming out in Nature Medicine. It's just been accepted and should appear fairly soon. It's the STOMP AD trial. It's only in five subjects. Um, I'll, you should read it, but I'll just say ahead of time that it looks like there's safety tolerability um, in that trial. There appears to be arguably target engagement with decreases in A beta 42 in the CSF. And there appears to be some improvement in adaptive immune, like the IL-17, IL-23 pathway, uh, inflammatory and senescence markers. But this is a very small study, only five subjects, you know, so we need to do a lot more. Um, there's another trial um, underway in um, people with um, a, a chronic HIV syndrome uh, run out of Northwestern. Uh, this is partly funded by the NIH and partly crowdfunded by people with persons with HIV. Um, so this trial is just getting um, underway. 
And this is based on extensive preclinical evidence that persons with chronic HIV have um, issues uh, with um, accumulation of senescent cells if they've got uh, brain fog and, um, and, other, and, and gait difficulty. Um, there were some studies that weren't specifically looking at senolytics um, uh, approaches, but using quercetin um, in uh, people with uh, um, COVID. Uh, and these were people from uh, ages um, 18 to 80. And there was a substantial decrease in hospitalization, percent needing oxygen, and percent needing ICU. This was an open label study, but it was uh, randomized. So this led to a trial to see if this may be senolytic related by giving intermittent fizetin. Fizetin is a five minute elimination half-life in mice. Uh, it truly is a hit and run uh, kind of agent. It's got, so it's first pass elimination half-life is five minutes. Um, second pass is three hours. We don't know what it is in humans and a trial actually beginning hopefully soon with Jan Nalen in uh, Copenhagen is going to be to do pharmacokinetics in humans measuring blood every few minutes to see what the elimination half-life is like. In the US, we have not had to do this because the FDA, the branch of the FDA that deals with these agents is the same that deals with antibiotics and they care about killing senescent cells, they don't care about pharmacokinetics, especially with a hit and run approach. So um, this has led to a number of trials for coronavirus which are currently underway, including one in nursing homes. And this is a way of getting into the nursing home population uh, and eventually trying to develop a parallel translational geroscience skilled nursing facility network. Uh, so we're trying to identify roadblocks to recruitment, et cetera. We have found that nursing home administrators are very eager to bring their nursing homes into these studies. We thought the opposite would happen. We found 90% of nursing home administrators are willing to do this. But there are a lot of blocks um, to uh, getting these trials underway and we're trying to sort through those. There are trials looking at trying to rehabilitate organs from older individuals so they can be transplanted into younger people. We've done a lot of work with Stefan Tullius at Harvard about this and published some papers about cardiac transplants from old to young animals and young to young animals, et cetera. And we find senescent spreads from the old heart to the young individual, and there's increased graft versus host disease. So with the Brigham, we're trying to rehabilitate hearts while they're in life port machines, I mean uh, kidneys before they're transplanted with Volker Kuypers, who's in the audience, we're looking at similar sorts of things with hepatic transplants at the University of Groningen in Holland. Um, there are trials to try to um, uh, improve function in uh, children, in people who, as children, before the age of 10, had um, uh, chemotherapy or um, radiation for cancers. Um, a certain percentage of these people who are followed for life at St. Jude um, uh, develop an accelerated aging state and they're dying at the age of 40 and, um, of Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, osteoporosis. So there's an NIH funded trial comparing two different sets of senolytics uh, in this population. And we, we know that this is, the likelihood of developing this syndrome is related to the uh, abundance of senescent cells on skin biopsies. We're developing cancer 1-2 punch approach uh, trials for glioblastoma is our initial starting point with people with Amaya cisterns. We know that 99.5% of people with stage uh, grade four or five glioblastoma will be dead at a year. They often get a remission for two or three months after tomatozolomide uh, radiation and um, surgery, but it always comes back. And this seems to be related to senescent cells that harbor glioblastoma that escape senescence. So uh, an emergency trial is about to begin for that. We're looking at space travel. Um, so we found that astronauts have high burden of senescent cells on return to Earth. Um, we've got results from three astronauts, which look very promising, but I don't like talking about ends of three. Um, and with uh, University of Texas San Antonio and Brookhaven National Lab, the cyclotron there, we found that solar flare radiation uh, is dramatically induces senescent. So hydrogen, helium, selenium, one, two, and three on the periodic table traveling at the speed of light. It only takes 0.5 grays to induce senescence, where with X-rays or gamma rays, it takes 10 to 20 grays. So in conclusion, fundamental aging mechanisms can begin at or before conception, consistent with the geroscience hypotheses. It looks like targeting these processes can affect most of the others, something that we're testing through the facility for geroscience analysis of the translational geroscience network. Um, our view is that gerodiagnostic composite signatures will be needed. Um, of accessible body fluids and other parameters. 
that indicate which intervention to use when uh, would show response to interventions and predict clinical effects, and hopefully would meet um, FDA, CLIA, and EMA criteria as, as endpoints, but that's a long way off and not, you know, would be very difficult to achieve. There are a lot of studies underway, but our view is that um, these interventions should not be used by the general public. They're, the place to use them is in carefully controlled clinical trials until we know if they're um, safe and effective. <laughs>